We're going to jump right into our preaching today. Amen. Matthew chapter number 10, verse number 26. This is our lectionary passage. We are still in the season of Pentecost. How many are appreciative that Pentecost is not a season with an expiration date? Maybe you don't know that. Amen. The scripture is constantly reminding us that God's spirit is available to everyone. Somebody say everyone. Amen. Uh, the most powerful passage in my uh, theological uh, uh, canon, if you will, C-A-N-O-N, is that scripture that says that in the last day, God will pour out God's spirit on all flesh. Everybody say all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your uh, Old men shall see dreams, even upon the servants and the slaves will I pour out my spirit, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That is such a powerful, what we call hermeneutic. It's a powerful interpretive lens for how to understand God's activity in the world. Because for many of us, as we have gone through our religious and social formations, how many of us can be honest and say that we have often been shaped to build our lives around who is excluded more than who is included, right? We are people, you know, if you are a black person who have grown up in the United States, you are constantly being reminded that you are not uh, a part of this country's history outside the story of slavery. If you are a, a immigrant, particularly from the Latin South America or descendants of indigenous people, you are constantly re- being reminded that you have been uh, either uh, brought here or came here escaping another place, but you're not Uh, an original American, whatever that means, right? And certainly, as we have heard earlier from Minister Lorne, if you sit at the intersection of, of queer plus identity, you are constantly being reminded that you don't fit in the boxes that have been considered normative, right? Uh, If you're someone who's come home from jail or prison and you got to walk around with the scarlet letter that says, I have a criminal conviction, you are constantly being reminded by either checking a box when you try to get an application or apply for housing or just try to go on a field trip with your child at school that you have a mistake that no one will allow you to forget. And so when I remember this passage that in the last day, God's going to pour out God's spirit on all flesh, it reminds me that all of these distinctions, God has told us God has a solution for the divisions that the world seeks to impose upon us and that we always have an opportunity to lean into God's activity among all flesh. And I want you to appreciate, child of God, that it is our task as the church, particularly in a time where politicization of all kinds of ideological assumptions are causing us to be at odds with creating a world where no one is at risk of being harmed because they're different. I mean, I I want you to know, child of God, you don't have to be a Christian in order for me to want you to not experience violence. It's quiet up in here. It's like, I don't know. I don't know, Pastor Mike. You know, if you ain't blood washed, I'm not concerned about your safety. No, the devil is a lie. (laughs) Matter of fact, I remember being in seminary, and one of our professors said that he had a solution, a proposal for world peace. And his proposal was, if every Christian in the world committed not to kill another Christian in the world, we would have peace in the world. 
And I thought about that thing. I thought about all the wars that have been fought between so-called Christian nations. I thought of all the people who have been harmed by so-called Christian conflicts. And I began to ask myself, God, am I being sucked into somebody else's project that is largely based in fear? That makes it all right for me to harm somebody in the name of God. How many of you know God, if God is indeed all powerful, and I believe God is, does not need our help (laughs) to do anything. Somebody say amen. God invites us to participate, as we preached a few weeks ago, in the divine nature of God. But how many of you can fully appreciate that when you and I participate in the divine nature of God, it is not to God's benefit. Hello, somebody. It's kind of like, you know, uh, the Warriors this, this week traded Jordan Poole to uh, Washington, the Wizards. <laughs> you know, Jordan Poole, just, you know, wonderful young player. Amen. But, you know, sometimes I think folks forget that the Warriors were champions before Jordan Poole got here. And perhaps, although Jordan Poole made some contributions, I'm not hating on Jordan Poole, sometimes you may think that you are bigger than you really are. Hello, somebody. That's how it is. Jordan Poole was participating in the Warriors championship culture. Well, when you and I partner with God, how many of you know we are participating with God's divine work in the world. It ain't because of you and me. Hey man, I know you special, praise God. <laughs> I know you got some secret swag sauce. Mm-hmm. I know you got a lot of, you know, you know, talent and skills. But I hope you understand that, you know, God don't need you to do much of anything. God invites us out of God's sheer abundance of love and generosity. You ought to give yourself a high five and tell him, I'm glad I'm rocking with God this morning. Amen. So Matthew chapter number 10 then is the gospel account by Matthew, who was, according to his own self story, a a Republican. Lord, have mercy. (laughs) He was a publican. Mm Mm-hmm. He was a tax collector. He was someone who was cheating his own people on behalf of the Roman Empire. Mm. See, that's where the Republicans go. I'm not going to fool with. I'm not fool. All the Republicans in here, I'm not, I'm not trying to troll you today. It was a Freudian slip, something that had been suppressed too long, and it just... <laughs> Let me, come on, I got to preach, y'all playing around. And Matthew had this encounter with Jesus that caused him to be a conduit, listen, for a, a, an account of Christ's work that would resonate with his cultural lineage of Jewish prophetic expectation. Matthew told the story of Jesus, remembering particularly Jesus' ministry as it laid across the prophetic, the prophesying expectations of the prophets that came before them. So Matthew, as Matthew teaches, as Matthew writes, as Matthew remembers, he's trying to make sure that every Jewish reader of his gospel would be clear that Jesus fulfilled all of our expectations. Likewise, Luke was writing to a Greek audience, and Mark was writing to a Roman audience, and John was writing against a particular sect of of philosophical assumptions that claimed that Jesus was not fully human and divine. He was just a ghost, like Casper, just floating through Palestine. They all had a particular, a particular approach. And so here we find Matthew. Uh, we're picking up this particular recollection of Matthew hearing and rem- being reminded of how Jesus was literally sending his disciples out into the world 
into the world. That would be at that time Judea, right? Out into the Palestine, Jewish, Israel nation uh, or lands and telling them to go and proclaim that the kingdom of God has come. Y'all get ready. Everything you've been praying for, it's here. And he's, Jesus is giving them examples. He's, Jesus is telling them, uh, go two by two. Don't go by yourself. That's some good wisdom for some of us who love to only shine alone. That you can't do the work of God by yourself. Give your neighbor a high five and tell him, I need you to survive. Go ahead, tell him that good old, good old, good old, good old church song, right? Uh, Jesus tells them, listen, when you go out, make sure that you are proclaiming the good news, not bad news. Jesus tells them that when you go to a, a particular city, look for a person of peace. Don't bring a lot of stuff with you on the journey, but be ready to live off the generosity of others. Jesus gives them all these great admonitions. And then he comes down to verse number 26, where we're going to pick up. And he says it like this. Have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell it in the light, and what you hear whisper, proclaim from the housetops. Verse 28. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear the one who has the power to destroy both soul and body in hell. Verse 29, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. Listen, you are of more value than many sparrows. It's the word of God for us, the people of the God. Let us say thanks be to God. So I'm going to just speak from a simple topic on this uh, Sunday, simply called, Yes, Jesus Loves You. Yes, Jesus loves you. Come on, let's pray. God, we ask you to bless the word that has been read for us, the people of God. Hide your word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. May it rest on me and even the hearers of your word. And we'll say thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. Everybody say yes. yes. Jesus loves you. Pat yourself on the chest say Jesus loves me. We grew up in, in the old school church singing that song, Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, they're all precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children. Then we say, yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, for the Bible tells me so. And this has to be one of our greatest challenges is that too often we are not finding the boldest declarations or at least we're not shouting them from the rooftops as Jesus told them to make sure that people know that yes, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you from the worst moment of your life. Jesus loves you through the worst conditions in your life. Jesus loves you at your highest moments. Jesus loves you without condition. Jesus just loves you. And isn't it interesting that Jesus can love us and yet we often find reasons to disqualify ourselves and others from Jesus' love. Is it not the case that sometimes we transpose the love of God onto us through the filter of the love or rejection of our parents or other authority figures? Often because we learn about God through the wisdom, the knowledge, the language, and the practices of those who are older than us. It could happen in a church. It could happen in our family. It could happen in a school or a seminary. Uh, and often the, the, the journey to learning about God is often filtered through the knowledge or the experience 
of those who expose us to God. But I have found the longer you live, even a narrow introduction to God always ends up with a magnanimous appreciation of God's love for us. That God's love for us cannot be reduced to my understanding of God's love for you. God knows how to love you so good that you'll be like, I don't care what the preacher say, I know God loves me. I don't, I don't care what, 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 what uh, the interpretation says, God loves me. And on a day like today, where we are seeing how politicized people's differences are, are literally playing out over social media. You know, I, I, I become, uh, I have become so frustrated with how ever since the, 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 the uh, Elon Musk takeover of Twitter has happened. You just seem to find all kinds of contested posts about everything. You know, it's like every every kind of every kind of uh, uh, species, uh, 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 conspiratorial idea. It just flows over into my uh, algorithm to the point where I don't even look at it no more. To be like, man, you know, they said the aliens came last week, and I was like, you know, I'm one of people who believe sometimes, you know, that they may pop up here one day, you know, and I was like, man, you know, the aliens came to Phoenix last week. I wish I was there to see that. Amen. And, you know, the, the, the other week, you know, they focused on the, on the, on the boat getting stuck at the bottom of the, of the, of the, of the Titanic, but, but they didn't focus on, you know, the immigrants who are literally all across the world sinking in boats and ships trying to find a, a way to safety. And there's a certain selectivity around ensuring that certain people's lives are more valued than others. And when you and I begin to internalize that certain people's lives are not loved by God, we become a bit paralyzed to the violence in the world that is often unleashed on vulnerable people. Now, I can recall many, many examples of this, but the most powerful one for me was when I was in seminary and I was learning about the Rwanda genocide. And it was a fascinating, troubling kind of exposition for me because in a country that was considered 90-something percent Christian, you found that the Hutus and the Tutsis were literally put in opposition to one another by the colonial powers, not because they were so different from one another, what, but it was a form of, of literally trying to maintain minority power and rule over the whole. And when the genocide started, it was literally for months, perhaps even years, people were conditioned to call the Tootsies cockroaches. And they had shows and they had radio programs and it just went out over the airways and they referred to a whole group of people as cockroaches. And when the genocide was launched by the Hutu powerful in their day, what we heard and what we saw were that people were so dehumanized in the national consciousness that folks were a bit slow to respond to the killing, the maiming, the persecution, and the death of their friends, family, church members, and country folk. Now, I know a lot of us feel like, oh, that can never happen in America, but I want you to know, child of God, it's already happening. We are seeing the literal demonization of immigrants right before us. The, 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 the demonization of the incarcerated before us. Those who have found themselves caught up in, in the criminal justice system, demonized. We're seeing now these crazy charges of every single LGBTQ plus plus person is now a groomer. And, and, and they're after your children. And we're seeing all these crazy out outlandish statements. Why? Because there is an effort to cause some of us to forget that, yes, Jesus loves you. Because if I can forget Jesus loves you as a Christian, then I will be more silent 
and paralyzed when certain people are under attack. But can you imagine if God treated us that way? If God found us to be disposable, if God found us to be people who were overly influenced by fear, this is why the scripture is so powerful in verse number 28, where the scripture says, do not fear the one who can just kill the body, but you better be worried about someone who can touch both of those places of your life at the same time. That there is an all-powerful God and force in the world that is inviting us to shed our fear of humans and actually have a healthy fear and respect for the divine creator of the universe. That I will not be driven by manufactured fear of people I don't know. When I am being called to actually embrace a relationship with the God of all creation who has taught us that when you learn to love perfectly, it casts out all of your fears. And that's why such a day like today, we thought it was important to at least put on center stage the idea that there are people among us in our families who are literally growing up and their lives and bodies are contested. Can you imagine how it feels to just be a contested human being? Some of us can because depending on our race, our gender, our sexual orientation, our status as a directly impacted person, because you may be poor, unhoused, sometimes people just get uncomfortable when they're around you. Anybody ever been around someone and you can just tell they're uncomfortable? Being around you, walking, walking down the street and they grab their purse. Uh, you know, with my old, you know, less than, uh, Cool days, you know, when I saw someone grab their purse, I would reach out and I would just jump at them. <laughs> that, that was, you know, I probably was only preaching for a year at that time. You know, I, like, I don't want your purse. No, I'm just, you know, just, yeah, give you, since you're going to be afraid, let me give you something to be afraid about. Let me let your heart skip a couple beats, praise God. Let me at least get something out of it. Yeah, I walk away feeling better than you did, praise God. <laughs> or you walk in a store, someone's just following you around. You trying to figure out, man, I'm, I'm here. Sir, uh, you know, this, you know, it's a very expensive piece of cloth you got. You're like, oh, well, you know, I thought my money spent good up in here, but, you know, you must not want this, you know, black American Express card, so I'll take my money somewhere else. Contested, right? Going to a classroom and folks assume. Going to your job, they assume. Go to a family reunion, they assume. Now imagine living your whole life with that consistent, consistent consciousness, and then you add God talk on top of it. Theological ruminations that say your body is ugly, your your feelings, your life, your existence is problematized. There is a psychological torture that too many of us experience often in the name of someone's take on God. And I want you to know today that God does not hate you. God created you. God loves you. God said you are fearfully and wonderfully made. And so the scripture then keeps reminding us, particularly in this passage, he says, are not two sparrows sold for a penny, yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. God wants you to appreciate, child of God, that you are connected to God. It is a gift to know that you are connected to God. Nothing can happen to you according to the words of Jesus Accept or nothing can happen to you and you not be apart from your father, from your heavenly parent, from your God. It means that God has God's hands on you. God is sticking it out with you. God is with you during the troubles of your life, during the, the, the celebrations of your life. God is with you at your highest moments and at your lowest points. God 
is with you. And if the sparrow cannot fall from the sky without God noticing it, don't you know that you are worth more than a bird? We had our, our meeting with the fathers at the, at the uh, Kahinde Wiley uh, exhibit, and the fathers were talking about how it felt for them to literally be fighting for justice for their child who'd been killed by the police. And what was interesting, one of the fathers, he said, I'm not fighting for human rights anymore. He said, I'm fighting for animal rights because an animal cannot have been treated as terribly as my own child. And it was like another take on this verse. If you believe that God loves the animals in this world, then why would you not believe that God loves you who are created in the image of this God? God wants you to know that you and God are connected. And listen, God is a lifelong sojourner with you through life. Uh, God is going to hang with you throughout the whole course of your life. Your mama and them may leave. Your partners and them may leave. But God is a good companion. Do I have anybody in here that can testify that God has stuck with me throughout every phase and season of my life? I, I love this other part where it says that God even counts the hairs on your head. <laughs> I know for some of us, amen, that's a little harder job than others, amen. Uh, but, but I want you to know this verse simply means that God is caught up in the minutia of your life. That God weeps with you when you weep. That God laughs with you when you laugh. These verses are intended to help you to appreciate that the God of all creation is not so far from you that you cannot have relationship with God that is mutual and reciprocal. God wants to be in deep, intimate interaction with us. And that's why we engage in these spiritual disciplines. Because the spiritual disciplines are the way in which we get into deeper relationship with God. Sometimes you got to turn off uh, YouTube and, 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 and Twitter and Snapchat and the PlayStation. Sometimes you got to turn off mm, all your shows and, and all the gossiping and all the drinking and the smoking and the partying. Sometimes you got to get still and say, I'm going to meditate on the laws of God. I'm going to spend some time in deep prayer with God. I'm going to look at nature and find the beauty of God in the world. I'm going to fellowship with some folk that I know love God and, and I know that God loves them. I'm going to make sure that whenever I find myself falling down into a place of depression and isolation that I'm going to get close to some people who can remind me that although the devil's trying to destroy me I serve a God who is able to lift me up on the wings of eagles and to cause me to fly higher than all of my troubles. I want to be reminded that there is a God uh, who loves me unconditionally uh, who believes that my life is more valuable than the sparrow uh, I might have been strung out on crack one time uh, I might have been out there on the streets at times uh, I might have been caught in a situation or two uh, but I am so glad uh, that if God is watching the sparrow uh, then you that's how I got out of that situation. God brought me out and gave me a mind to be reminded that though you slay me, though you try to throw me away, though you try to diminish me, the God I serve, the God I serve loves me. He loves me with an everlasting love. He loves me with a love no one can take. He loves me with a love that brings me joy. He loves me with a love that brings me healing. He loves me with a love that brings me power. He loves me with a love that brings me salvation. And I am glad that I can say, yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves you for the Bible. Tells you so. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, you and you, whoever you are, whatever your name is, whatever. 
whatever your background is, whatever your bank account is, whatever your social status is, God said, whosoever, do I got a whosoever in the building? I am a whosoever. I was busted up. I was discarded. I was rejected. But God he loved me. Somebody shout hallelujah. Next week I'll preach with my belt on. <laughs> so we can be reminded over and over again that we are loved by God. It's a simple message, but yet on a day like today, it may feel profound. God loves you. Pastor Silver just said, God loves me. There ain't no mistake you can make that disqualify the love of God. Yes, Jesus loves me. There is a practice of religion, I believe, that's often over influenced by Western white supremacist colonial powers that would like you and I to believe that God only loves us with conditions. Whew. But I want you to know that there is no condition that disqualifies you from God's love. And so my hope and prayer today is that we then will be God's church that loves one another with an everlasting love. And in that loving be reminded that yes, Jesus loves us. Come on, stand to your feet, everyone. Let's prepare to pray. If you don't mind grabbing the hand of someone next to you or just touching someone in some solidarity today. God, we want to say thank you for who I'm touching today. Thank you, Lord, that you love them. You love us. You love me with a love that is more precious than that which you have for the sparrows. There is no greater act than this, no greater showing of love the one who will lay down their life for a friend. So as I'm touching my beloved today, I pray that you will remind them that they are loved by you. I pray that you would be reminding them that wherever they are in their life, whatever journey, whatever posture, that their value is not called into question. Whatever story has been told to them in their mind, I pray, God, that they will constantly be reminded that you love them with an everlasting. Whatever narrative is being painted and portrayed in the world, I pray, God, that you would remind them that they are loved by you. So, God, show us how to love one another better, how to support one another better using the love that you have poured out among us. Lift those hands right where you're standing. So God, I'm asking you to bless me for it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. I need to love myself, oh God, today. I need to let myself experience your love. I need to cut through the dangerous, harmful ways in which I have attributed abusive love to you, the God of all creation that loves well. I pray, God, that I will receive this love today, a love that reminds us that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk after the Spirit. God, we want to be people of your Spirit, being driven and moved oh god by the power of your love so god we accept this love somebody say i accept your love oh god i accept the love that 
heals hurts. I accept the love that causes me to love across differences, across lines that are contested. I accept the love that causes me to embrace others that are different from me. I accept the love that helps me to forgive myself from the trauma that I've endured. And so we say thank you, Lord. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for reminding us that the love that, that we causes me to love today. Across. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, hug two or three people and tell them, yes, Jesus loves you. Go ahead, tell them that, yes, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you.